invite you to turn again this morning to Matthew chapter 24. As we continue to look at this prophecy our Lord Jesus gives us. So let me read the first four verses and then we'll see it from His perspective. Remember in chapter 23 He has delivered one of the most condemning denouncements of the Pharisees. It'd be no less true of you and me when our religion is just shallow and hypocritical. But the Pharisees and the scribes were leading the nation of Israel away from the one true God. They are rejecting their Messiah. They refuse to acknowledge who He is. And now the Lord Jesus is saying to them, your house, not my house, and there are a lot of churches today that are monuments to man's ingenuity. We have built expansive and expensive buildings, and the presence of God is nowhere there. Your house is being left to you desolate, and you will not see me again until you see me coming in the glory of the clouds. Now that shocked the disciples. Because the center of religious life was the temple. And now he's going to put them in further shock when he says, start with verse 1 of chapter 24. He came out from the temple, was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Uh, you can put yourself maybe in their place. This was a magnificent structure. Center of worship. center of society the place where quote God dwelt and they're pointing out to him look at that building and then Jesus announces to them do you see all of these things truly I say to you not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down and as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Now, let me stop right there. This prophetic message of the Lord Jesus that he is giving to us, that he gave to them that day, infuriated the enemies, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. They wanted this pretended Messiah to shut up. And not only to shut up, they wanted Him out of the way. And now He totally shocks His disciples as He predicts the total destruction of this magnificent structure, the temple. And that prompted these three questions. And we know from Mark that Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked these three questions. When will this happen? In other words, when will the temple be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? And we've already looked at the fact that our Lord didn't answer in Matthew the first question. Luke gives us that answer in Luke 19 and chapters 19 and 21. He begins with the, sec the third question first. Now, uh, keep in mind, and I, I'll get to these little words in a minute. Say that no one misleads you. You and I, folks, we're looking at everything going on in this world today, the pandemic. We live in fear. We live in anxiety. We're being shut down on every level by those that have no authority to do this. And yet you and I are living in that kind of structure. We're living in a world that is collapsing around us morally, politically, socially. We're living in lawlessness. We're living in riots. We're living in absolute total chaos. And yet we're looking at it through the wrong lens. We're not looking at it biblically. I don't know what God's going to do. 
But I do know again what I keep repeating to you. This did not take him by surprise. He's not caught off guard. He's in control of it. But what he wants from you and me today is to see it from a biblical perspective and then stand on the truth of God's Word with power and conviction and courage, share the gospel. These are Jewish disciples. And so they're looking at it from the Old Testament perspective. They have not yet clearly grasped the fact of who Jesus really is. They know He is the Messiah, but they're looking for this Messiah to set up the kingdom that they were so familiar with over and over promised in the Old Testament. Set up the kingdom. Sit on the throne of your father David. So all of these questions they're asking may sound foolish to you and me, but not to them. They were asking in sincerity. They wanted to understand what was going on. And, and all three of these are related in the Old Testament. Zechariah 14, 1 through 11. You can read about that and the destruction of the temple and the coming of the Messiah and the end of the age. Now from hindsight, you and I know that the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. when Titus and the Roman army conquered Jerusalem. That's already occurred. But what about these other questions? What does everything going on today have to do with this, folks? How am I to look at it through a biblical lens? And we're prone to look at it through secular lens. Our Lord in Matthew chapters 24 and 25 is looking forward to His second coming to the earth. And I hope I don't have to remind you that what we call the second coming is a series of events. And the next event is uh, the rapture. And now our Lord in Matthew chapters 24 and 25 is dealing with this period right here, the tribulation. Everything you and I see happening around us today are shadows, folks. They are indicators. And even in the 24th and 25th chapters, scholars are not always agreed, especially about the birth pains. I, I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, birth pains are familiar to us. If you've had children, you understand that. This was a technical term that the rabbis would use in the Old Testament to describe the time of persecution and horror that would come upon the nation of Israel. Jake, uh, Jeremiah 37, the time of Jacob's trouble. So let me remind you that in the tribulation, this will be a time when God will resume His dealings in a very definite and specific way with the nation of Israel to bring the Jews to their Messiah that they rejected the first time. And if I do not see the Jewishness of these two chapters, if I do not understand who our Lord is addressing and what He is saying, then I'm going to look at it in a perverted way and I will not have the true biblical perspective on it. Everything about Matthew chapters 24 and 25 deal primarily with the nation of Israel. And we went over that last week, folks. I'm not going to go back over it again. The Jews are God's chosen people. Chosen not because they deserve to be chosen, not because they were more numerous than any other nation on the face of this earth, but out of the sovereign will and design of God, He chose them. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. And they are still His chosen people today. And in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, our Lord is dealing in this time frame with the tribulation and what God's going to do in the life of the nation of Israel to bring them to their Messiah. It's essential that you and I understand this. Jesus very clearly in Matthew chapters 24, in Matthew 24 and 25 outlines the events of the tribulation. And I put this up here last week. He divides the tribulation into two parts, three and a half years and three and a half years. 
in verses 4 through 14, he's dealing with the first half of the tribulation. And then from 14 to 29, he's dealing with the second half. And then the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And he begins to give to those people an understanding of what's going to happen. And somehow you and I just sit in the fog. We were talking about that Wednesday night. We, we just get fogged up. We don't understand. We don't see the Scriptures as a whole. And we don't comprehend what we need to know. And therefore we're not being the witness that Jesus wants us to be. So go back to that little fourth verse in Matthew chapter 25, uh, 4 for a moment. Listen to what Jesus is saying to these Jewish disciples. And He's saying this to you and me today. See to it that no one misleads you. This is applicable to you and me, although this applies mainly to the tribulation period and what's going to be happening with these birth pains. But he's saying to you and me today, on this side of the tribulation, and we're here this morning so the rapture hadn't taken place, unless all of us are, are extremely confused and deceived, see to it, and the word see to it, is a present imperative in the Greek. This means this needs to be the constant attitude of your mind and your life. See to it. It's a, it's a command in the Greek. It literally means to set your mind down on something to be able to mentally discern what's going on. How do I see what's going on today? Do I see it from that secular cultural viewpoint? from a world system that operates on principles that are directly contrary to the Word and the will of God? Or am I seeing it from God's perspective, from that biblical perspective? Not only does it mean to set your mind down on something, it means to weigh it out very carefully so that you understand what you are seeing. I, I don't apologize for making you think are stretching your minds because most of us don't think. We don't think. And so we panic. We live by feelings and emotions. We let people direct our thoughts and tell us what to do and what not to do. See to it, he said. Present tense verb. This needs to be your continuous mindset. It's a command from God. So if I do not obey this command, that's S-I-N in my life, sin. Weigh it out very carefully so that you are not misled. And that word misled literally means to lead somebody astray from the right way. You're walking down a path that will get you to an intended destination and then suddenly you begin to stray. You step off of that path. And that will lead you into error. It will lead you into deception. see to it. So let me let me stretch your minds a little bit further. In these two chapters, Matthew chapters 24 and 25, again Jesus is speaking to Jewish disciples. But you and I have a completed revelation. We have no excuse for not knowing what God is saying to us. And he's saying to you and me on this side of the rapture before it occurs, you need to look at what's going on in the world, in your culture, in your personal life, in your business life. You need to look at all of it through a biblical grid. You need to sift everything back through Scripture so that you're not being misled, so that you don't step off of that path and you find yourself in an, era of, in an area of deception and darkness and confusion. And that's where a lot of people are today, even in the church. So when he begins to talk in these two chapters, there are three different views that people take about what he means here. Let's... I'll try to walk us through this so we can understand. Let me explain these three different views to you. There is what is known as the preterist view. I'll write that up on the board. Preterist view. 
And again, it is amazing how people come to this conclusion. The word previous is a Latin word which means past. Past. So if you hold to the previous view, that would believe that Matthew chapters 24 and 25 and the book of Revelation and Daniel chapter 9 are past events that happened in the first century. Does that make sense? These events that our Lord is talking about here and in the Revelation as John described it and Daniel chapter 9, they've already happened. Hmm. Happened in the first century. Goodness. That's the preterist view. This is not predictive prophecy. So when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman army, to them that meant Jesus came in judgment in a cloud that answered those questions. Wow. Goodness. But it ignores the other two questions. In fact, down in verse 24, Jesus said, 34, Jesus said, this generation will not pass away. But here in Matthew 24, Jesus doesn't even address the destruction of the temple. So here's what you have to do to come to this, folks. You have to use spiritual gymnastics and twist and distort the Scriptures to fit your own opinion. You understand this morning, you can make the Bible mean whatever you want it to mean. That, that's easy. But if you follow the correct rules of grammar and interpretation, you can't do that. God has only one intended meaning, and He intends for me to get to that meaning. So if I held to the previous view that all of these events were in the past, what are we looking forward to? The second view is a little bit different from that one. This is the entire age view. Entire age view. And those who hold to this theory, the entire age view, will tell us that Matthew chapter 24, 4 through 14 are general signs that will mark the progress of of the present day that you and I live in. And you don't get to the tribulation until you get to Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew 24, verse 15. So that means that all, some of these things are going on right now where we are. And they will continue to go on side by side. And to be sure, you can look at some of these birth pangs that we're about to look at and down through the ages we've seen a lot of this taking place but when you keep it all in context here in Matthew 24 it's like a woman in birth all of a sudden those birth pains come upon her and they increase with a greater degree in frequency this is in a time frame so in some sense you might say, well, the entire age is here. We've seen all these things. We've seen false Christ. We've seen wars and rumors and wars. But not the way it's going to be in this seven-year period of tribulation. There's a third view, and this is the one that I hold. The futurist view. These are yet future. The seven-year period of tribulation is going to be what Jesus described, verses 4 through 14, the first type, and 14 through 29, 28 to 7. There, and when you look at Matthew chapter 24, there is an orderly sequence in all of these things. One of the most respected expositors today is Dr. John MacArthur. Uh, Dr. MacArthur is, uh, and I don't want to use all these terms, he is a pre tree of pre millennialist. That means he believes that the millennium won't happen until Jesus comes back. And 
and that the church is going to be taken out before the tribulation. This is what he says. I, I, I don't, don't want to misquote it. It seems more sensible and more consistent, therefore, to take a futurist approach with respect to the Olivet Discourse, to interpret the entire discourse as a prophetic picture of a generation and events that will take place long after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. These are events that will immediately precede Christ's coming to establish His kingdom, and therefore they are events that are yet future even right now. That's the most uh, consistent way to interpret Matthew chapters 24 and 25. And He's outlining, Jesus is outlining for us what Israel is going to face as she looks for her Messiah. One, another one of my favorite prophecy teachers is Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who pastors in Edmond, Oklahoma. And in his commentary on this, this is four key phrases that I want us to use as we work our way through that that will help us to understand what's going on. Number one, the beginning of birth pain. In verse 8 of chapter 24, all these things are merely the beginning of birth pain. The second one is the abomination of desolation in verse 15. This is the middle point of the tribulation when the Antichrist will march into the temple and rip off his mask. The third one is the great tribulation in verse 21. For then there will be such a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now or ever will be. And then the fourth phrase, immediately after the tribulation, in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, Jesus is going to come back. You know what's easy for you and me to do? Woo! That's a long way off. In your wildest imagination, did you ever believe we would be in this situation in our country today? Is this all fun and games? Is this smoke and mirrors? There are a lot of things that are at work today, folks. And if I don't see this biblically, I'm not going to understand what's going on around me. Jesus is outlining for us what we need to know, what we need to understand. And again... One of the purposes for the tribulation is to bring the nation of Israel to their Messiah. And we talked about that at length last week. The Jews are God's chosen people. They are distinct in law. They are distinct in their customs. They are distinct in every way. Chosen by God in His sovereign grace. To be a witness to the unity of God in the middle of universal idolatry. And I, <laughs> this is where we are in America today, folks. They were chosen to illustrate to other nations there's a greater blessing when you serve the one true living God. They were to receive and preserve the divine revelation. And they were to be the progenitors of the Messiah. Jesus was a Jew. He came through the line of David. And I need to understand that. And then I can look at the world around me and I begin to see what's taking place, what's going on. And the scriptures began to take on a different meaning for me. Why is there such an interest in Israel? Why should you and I be concerned about that today? This was where God became incarnate, folks. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Israel. It's to this place that Jesus is coming back, Zechariah chapter 14. It is here that the last battle will be fought, the battle of Armageddon. And I've stood on the plain of Megiddo, and that is big enough to hold the entire armies, all the armies of the world, I can assure you. It is here that you and I are seeing a family feud today that will never know rest and peace until the Prince of Peace between the Arabs and the Jews 
between Isaac and Ishmael. It is here that God promised to Abraham a land, a seed, and to be a blessing to the whole world. And that's why you and I need to understand exactly what is happening into this, in this world today. They are God's chosen people. He promised them, if you obey me, you'll stay in the land. If you don't obey me, I'll scatter you to the four ends of the earth. And you will be hated by all nations. And you, in your lifetime and my lifetime, have seen that. The benchmark today for us is that little nation of Israel. I need to understand what's going on. Or I can just refuse to do that and be led astray and never see it from a biblical perspective. Never understand when the news comes on about Jerusalem, about Israel, what, what is happening in the world today. And I already mentioned last week about the, the Abraham Accord with the, the United Arab Emirates and the nation of Israel and how all of that plays into Scripture and prophecy. So let me, let me stretch your mind a little bit further this morning. How do you know all this is true, Richard? Well, when you go back to the beginning, which for us in the Bible would be Genesis. In beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he put every, every race and tribe on this earth, folks. And then in the middle of all of that, God in His sovereign will and grace and plan and design chose the nation of Israel for the reasons I've already given to you this morning. And when He chose them, He made four covenants with them. So you need to listen to me very carefully. Four covenants He made with the nation of Israel. All of these four covenants, he made five, but four of them, all of them are still in effect today. Now hear that well. God has not annulled those covenants. He has not dissolved them. He has not said it's over, it's finished. I will not bring them to completion. They are easily traceable down through history. And the fact that the Jews have continued to survive, that they are a nation today, is testimony to the sovereign power and grace of God in keeping them. You know how many attempts have been made to exterminate the Jews? I'm not going through all that with you. But they belong to God. They're in His sustaining power and purpose. So He made four covenants with them. The fifth covenant was a conditional covenant. That meant that if it was going to be, that was the Mosaic covenant. Here they are. Let me give you these four covenants, folks. And understand, and I'll explain this in a moment. Understand all four of these covenants are in effect today. And if I can understand these covenants, I begin to see the Bible in a different perspective. The first foundational covenant that God made with Israel is the Abrahamic covenant. You can read about that in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. And in the Abrahamic covenant, God promised Abraham three things. Now listen very carefully. He promised them a land. We call that today the promised land. That's why it's called the promised land. He promised it to them. He promised them a seed. And He explained to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, if you can count the number of stars in the sky, if you can count the number of grains of sand on the seaside, then you can count how many Israelites there will be. He promised them a seed, and then He promised them a third thing. You will be a blessing to the whole world. That's very simple. Now think that thing through with me today. Do they possess all the land God gave them today? No. 
They've never possessed all the bounty. Never. So if God is finished with them, then you can throw the Abrahamic covenant out. He lied to them. <coughs> but He made it very clear over and over and over and over again, these covenants that I'm making with you are unconditional. And that simply means there is no condition that you have to keep for me to fulfill that. It's all on me. I'll keep the covenant. So if they've never possessed the land that God gave them, when's that going to happen? It's going to happen after the tribulation. The seed promise was fulfilled. The seed found the ultimate fulfillment in the seed, Jesus Christ. Who was born of the seed of David. But he is yet to sit on the throne of his father David, has he? It's not reigning today except in heaven. And the blessing part of it, the blessing has extended to the whole world. And we'll see that in the fourth covenant he made with them, and that's the new covenant. We, we are blessed by the fact that Jesus became our sin bearer, our substitute. He fulfilled the, the conditions of the new covenant. He went to the cross and died in my place, poured out his blood. And the scriptures are equally clear. Those nations that bless Israel will be blessed. Those that curse Israel will be cursed. That's Abrahamic covenant. The second covenant he made with them is called the Palestinian covenant. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapters 28, 29, and 30, where again God reinforces the land promised to them. But he makes it very clear, if you do not obey me, if you live in continuous rebellion, I'll jerk you up off of this land and I'll scatter you to the four ends of the earth. But he also promised if I jerk you up and scatter you, I'm going to bring you back because the land belongs to you. The third covenant he made is the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 7. He made the covenant with King David that David's seed the lineage of David would always have the right to the throne of God. So when Jesus is born, the Gospels describe him born of the seed of David. And one day the greater David is going to sit on that throne in Jerusalem. And the fourth covenant is the new covenant. Jeremiah chapters 31-32 I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And that new covenant would be validated and ratified by the blood of the Lamb of God. And therefore, because of that new covenant today, folks, it's a blessing to the whole world, whether you're Jew, Gentile, black, white, doesn't matter. Whosoever will. Whoever receives that gift of eternal life, you will know the blessing that God has purchased for you. All of these covenants are described in Scripture, number one, that they're unconditional covenants. That means the condition for fulfillment doesn't rest on you and me. They are eternal covenants. What does eternal mean? Six months? Ten years? hundred years? It means eternal. Forever and forever and forever. And there are covenants that are made with a covenant people. The nation of Israel. So therefore for these covenants never to be fulfilled, folks, would mean that God has been untrue to His promise. I don't worship that kind of God. I just want to challenge you. You may think, well, that's not that doesn't apply to me, but I can assure you it does apply to you. The God that I worship is a God of faithfulness. He's trustworthy. He is true to His Word. And what He said He would do, He's going to do. And that's why in this seven-year period of tribulation, He's going to bring the nation of Israel to recognize their Messiah. 
He will stand when he comes back on the Mount of Olives, and we'll see that. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two when he returns. He's coming back. He's coming back, first of all, for his bride, the church. And then he's coming back at the end of the tribulation. And then all of the conditions of these covenants will be fully met. That's what we need to understand. That's where we are. <coughs> he is coming. And until then, in this parenthesis, you and I need, the age of the church, you and I need to understand what God is doing. I don't have all the answers to this pandemic, but I have repeatedly said this over and over and over. There is a design behind everything that's going on, folks. A cashless society, a new world order, pushing people to be vaccinated and chipped. All of this preparing us for the Antichrist to reign and rule on this earth. And I close with this. I, it was an interesting post the other day. The World Health Organization Director General reveals the true ambitions behind pushing the coronavirus pandemic. Hear this well. This is the World Health Organization. This is the Director General that is pushing this pandemic. Here it is. The left progressive institutions like the World Health Organization have been using the pandemic to further their globalist agenda from day one. Not only do they see this as an opportunity to usher in the new world order, but also to move forward with their zealous climate change ambitions. How many times have you heard them say, we can never go back to the way things were before the virus? <laughs> this is your new normal. And people have bought into all that, folks. And you may think I'm out of my mind up here. I'm not lessening the fact that there is a virus going around. I'm not lessening that fact at all. But we have become like puppets and sheep and let people dictate to us what we can and what we cannot do. And I, I'm so tired of hearing that. But use common sense. Common sense is totally contrary to faith. This is this is not about the coronavirus, folks. This is about a world agenda. And the world is being set up for the Antichrist. And you and I need to see it from his perspective. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Again, I will say, and I, the rapture could happen before this day is over. When God will call his bride up out of this world to meet him in the air. If you're here inside the sanctuary and you've never trusted Christ or you're watching on Facebook or YouTube and you've never put your faith in Him, then I invite you in this moment to understand very clearly there is no other way to the Father except through the Son. It does not matter who you are, what you are, what, what you are clinging to, what you're betting on to get you to heaven. There's only one way and that's through the finished work of the Lord Jesus, the Son who loved us enough to die for us. Would you pray this prayer with me this morning? Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I accept Him. I receive Him as my Lord and my Savior. If you prayed that prayer, you can come forward this morning or you can let us know on Facebook or YouTube. We'd love to hear from you if you prayed that prayer. Don't let anybody mislead you. Do not be deceived. Deb is going to lead us in a hymn of commitment. Holy Spirit is speaking to you very clearly in this moment. Would you respond to him as Debbie leads us? 223.
we will get into the birth pains as our Lord lays them out for us so that we will be aware of everything happening around us.